So as you can see from the reflection in my car, this is the Space Needle. It was built by NASA along with Disney Imagineers a long time ago. Uh, plans were announced to build the Space Needle back in the 60s. Both NASA engineers and Disneyland Imagineers were contracted to work on the Hush Hush project. The NASA workers were told they were building a new rocket, whilst the Disney workers were told they were building George Jetson's house for some reason. Project Space Needle was off to a booming start. It wasn't until astronaut Slater Jones and Imagineer Fiona Cobsworth got together romantically that suspicions that something very shady was going on with the Space Needle were raised. Low-key investigations by Slater and Fiona led the pair to suspect the Needle was in fact a super weapon. But their investigations weren't low-key enough and they were promptly terminated. Slater and Fiona's forced retirement didn't phase them, not one bit. They married and had a couple of kids, I, I suppose, making Seattle their home. The Joneses' youngest son, Gordon, had an eventful journey from child to adulthood. His parents adopted him from a crash flying saucer. Not exactly a legal adoption, they wrote Gordon's birth certificate on a napkin, but the saucer had illegally parked on their property, so buyer beware. Uh, Kavion and Tor, something. Later, a radioactive bald eagle bit Gordon, carried him away, and dropped him in a cave full of bats. And Gordon also held aloft his magic sword and said, By the power of Greystone. So it wasn't a surprise at all for Slater and Fiona when their son decided to go into superheroing as a profession. And Phoenix Jones rose from the ashes of mild mannering to take on Seattle's seedy underbelly of shoplifting, overstaying parking, loitering, and littering. And loitering. Identities, gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us this morning. And let me start with you, Phoenix Jones. And the question many people want to know, Phoenix, why? No, but seriously. Okay, uh, there is a man in Seattle, Washington, who likes to call himself Phoenix Jones, and he also considers himself a real-life superhero. What is this guy, kick-ass? <laughs> had lunch with one today. His name is Phoenix Jones. That's him. Can you see him? Oh, look, it's Dwight. He has, he has stopped crimes. He's gotten stabbed. He's gotten shot. He's gotten his nose broken. He's taken away 197 crack pipes from people. <laughs> I'm not kidding. He wow. really is doing... The work, and the, the police, they, they're not allowed to say it, they kind of dig him. He's uh, and they like, do. Yeah, they're kind of like, we're not going to go down there. Let's get Phoenix Jones. Wow. The man who calls himself Phoenix Jones. Almost every night he goes into a bookstore, comes out a superhero, and patrols the mean streets of Seattle. Uh, he foiled a car theft the other day. Would the uh, victim says he saw a guy trying to jimmy his car door when this spandex crime fighter jumped in and chased the crook away. I just can't but the memory of Phoenix's childhood bedtime stories surrounding the Space Needle mystery that his parents lullabied him to sleep with always haunted him. The place to go for an everyday superhero to solve mysteries was the late night talkback radio show Coast to Coast AM. Cringing past the conspiracy theorists, Phoenix sat up and took notice when he heard talk of a weapon in Seattle, Washington that was in the shape of the Jetsons' house. In the state of Washington, west of the Rockies, there was a television show, a cartoon, I loved it when I was a boy, called The Jetsons. Of course. And Phoenix knew what they were talking about. But it's a weapon. It's not being used to generate free, uh, free energy for people. It's a weapon. A, a few weeks ago, a Russian scientist said that the calamities on the planet Libyan, Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi, the huge giant earthquakes, northeastern part of Japan, and Friday, sung by 13 year old Rebecca Black, were being caused by the United States using some kind of electromagnetic weapon. Come on, come on, y'all. 
explain that. Explain the the uh, scalar electromagnetic weapon bar. Well, uh, basically, it's a uh, it creates uh, uh, canceling electromagnetic fields in the atm- upper atmosphere, and it, uh, it produces movement in the clouds. It's a long range. Uh, Weapon that you know uh, that reach can reach around the world. Also, you can pump the atmosphere. So, so what woodpecker? You can go on the internet. You can hear it. The woodpecker signal. So, well, do you... This is a disc-shaped object that I photographed in the middle of the day. So what I said to myself is, what's going on? How do these things stay in the air? So I started doing analysis and the uh, study of anti-gravitic effects. It's a weapon. Hey, George, listen, I was an instructor at the National Security Agency, and I was in a compartment like everyone else. And I didn't know X, what, what Y was doing. If everything is secret... What they wanted you to know, Bob, is that you saw the piece of puzzle that you were working on, but you couldn't see the rest of the puzzle. That's and right. That's, and that's the way they do it. Whoever's president just comes in with an axe. Well, I don't want to uh, uh, get people too worked up, but this is serious. I, you know, my complaint is that extraterrestrials are implanting our scientists. I don't know, George. We've got to wake up. we really got to start moving. Phoenix agreed with the scientist, and he had to start moving. Under the cover of night, Phoenix Jones visited the Space Needle, only to find that the saucer-shaped top was, in fact, a missile chamber. It had been blasting Rebecca Black's Friday song around the planet, causing floods, earthquakes, and su- self-harm. Coast to Coast AM was right. But if that wasn't terrible enough, on this particular Friday, there was a countdown to the missile's launch to collide with the city of Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada thus causing a US-Canadian war. As the countdown passed the one minute mark, Phoenix felt a sense of urgency. That coupled with the arrival of the police, who in fact didn't dig him. Sorry Dwight. All this forced Phoenix to make the decision to lock himself in the chamber and manually steer the missile away from Canada after takeoff. He did but ended up in orbit. He used his last cell phone reception bar to telephone the one place he thought he could get help. Even they found his story a little far-fetched. First time caller line, welcome to Coast to Coast. Hi there. Hey George, this is Phoenix Jones. I'm above the Rockies, inside the Space Needle, orbiting the Earth. I need help re-entering the atmosphere. If some of your UFO experts could help. Hello. <laughs> this. <laughs> you can't laugh at me. I'm Phoenix Jones. I've been on TV. And not just Fox News. I- I've been on CNN, George. <laughs> the real news. You believe the guy about the leprechauns. You believe the guy about the ghost of his great great grandmother. But you won't believe me? Well, I've had it with you and Coast to Coast. <laughs> Goodbye. Oh my gosh, that is cool. Um, I've I've lost my composure here. But hey, thanks for the call. Appreciate it. I got to move on. Luckily, the Vancouver superheroine, known as Mountie Leaf Wendy, had also entered orbit. She on board the Vancouver Lookout Tower. She had just sabotagedly foiled its attempted launched attack on Seattle. The two docked their vessels and lived happily ever orbiter. Ironically, the song Friday was now being broadcasted far off into the distant universe, further than any other song had ever gone before. Like so many other things in life, The universe then bounced the song back down to Abbey Road Studios, broadcasting Friday to the distant past. The Fab Four heard Rebecca Black's tune pulsating out of their studio speaker, and they ran with it the best they could. I see my friends. 
Shit. Oh, I'm sorry. Back down in Seattle, without its superhero, the Seattleites were free to loiter once again. There they are now. Florida, there was another Starbucks. I used to walk to it every Sunday. It was a little one, it wasn't famous at all. I miss that one in Florida. This one, I don't know at all. I've got that blue car, I'll just take it there. Next stop, Florida, Starbucks. You can buy a second Starbucks. The University and Golden Rod Starbucks. Tremendously better than the Pike Place one we just left. The 1,750 square feet freestanding drive through accessible Starbucks was opened the 1st of July 2006. Inside you'll find all your favourite blends, free Wi-Fi and hot baristas. They put the star in Starbucks. You'll put the bucks in. And speaking of expensive drinks, I then went down the boulevard to a place called Full Sail. There's a lot of movie posters on the wall. This one looks good. Through a painting darkly. A lot of talented people made this. You should all watch this now. <laughs> 